All right, guys. Thanks for staying back, whoever stayed back. Uh, good audience. Uh, so again, this is a presentation about revenue management for vacation rentals. You have already heard some pretty good stuff. Uh, but what I wanted to touch upon was go a little more uh, in depth and look at some data and how you can look at some data to figure out whether revenue management is right for you um, and what kind of revenue management strategies you should be doing or what kind of things people do in general. So revenue management is essentially about uh, optimizing your availability and your prices. So obviously you want your prices to go up and down, but you also want to manage your availability, which is your minimum, res minimum stay restrictions. Uh, and before we even go further, it's, it's important to ask, like, why do we want to do this? Why should vacation rentals be doing this? Uh, and the answer to that is, if you sell anything, not just vacation rentals, you should be figuring out what your pricing should be. Uh, and every single night that you sell is, is a product in itself in some ways. So it's, its price can be different and it should be different. Uh, it's something that similar industries have been doing for a while. Uh, vacation rentals are just catching up in some ways, and there's a reason for that. Uh, from what from what I've understood about the industry, uh, pricing is something that comes at the very end. There's there's a lot more work to be done before you establish all your support network to to figure out that you need to go and do dynamic pricing or revenue management right now. The first step is you you need to get good inventory. I think Cam as well touched upon this that unless you have good inventory it's going to be a little hard to get good rates for your properties. Uh, you need to have efficient operations. So can you, can you get enough crew to do the cleaning? If you, if you take single night bookings or two night bookings or three night bookings, all of this depends on can you get enough people, if you start taking single night bookings, can you schedule enough cleaners to come and do your job? Uh, can you have enough people come and do the key exchange or the welcome or the checkouts and stuff like that? Uh, and then it comes to, okay, now that you have sort of your operations ready, uh, your inventory is good, now you need to figure out, okay, how do I make sure that this is a business that's going to run for a while? And th that's where making sure that re revenue is more than your cost comes in. Um, and again, even in that space, I would say revenue management is sort of at the very end. You first need to figure out how do you tell people that, hey, I have this inventory and I want to sell, so if you are coming to my city, come book with me. Uh, that's where your sales and advertising comes in. Uh, also channel management. Channels are just another way of advertising. Um, so once you have all that set up, then you can go and say, okay, now that I have optimized everything else about my business, I am getting, to begin with, nobody is going to sell your properties at 10 bucks or, or 10,000 bucks. You are going to sell, be selling at reasonable rates to begin with, but now you can start thinking about how do I go a step further and optimize that? How do I get that 5, 10, 15, 18% increase uh, from where I started? Now, there are a few levers that, that are available for any vacation management company. Uh, the first one is understanding your competitive landscape. And this is where understanding what kind of property you have and what kind of market you exist in helps. So London is going to be priced in general at much higher than Barcelona is going to be just because of the, because of the kind of economies there are, the cost of living, et cetera. Uh, but within London, every single property is different. So you need to know what kind of properties you have and what kind of properties, what kind of prices these properties can fetch. And this is what most property managers already do. They, they are pretty good about this. Uh, but even then, it, it's important to keep experimenting. So you've been selling at, say, 200, uh, pounds a night all through last few years, and it's been doing great. Do you want to go ahead and experiment with maybe set it a little higher or a little lower to see, maybe when you set it a little higher, you might get more revenue. You might, your occupancy might drop, but you might get more revenue. The, the owners will need some convincing that less occupancy is okay because you got more money in the end. Uh, but there is value in experimenting with this itself. The second lever that comes in is now to make these prices dynamic. So a lot of property managers already do this. So almost no one that I that we work with has flat pricing throughout the year. So everybody does at least seasonal pricing. So during in north in the northern hemisphere, most of the places, uh, Florida side, um, summers are going to be higher priced and winters are going to be lower, etc. And this people people already understand that and they do this. 
Um, does she say how many minutes we have? No, no, it's just that we're on time. Okay. <laughs> uh, so that's about seasonality, and most people understand that. Then there's the day of week effects, and uh, we'll, we'll go into a lot of this in detail and look at some charts to see, okay, how do you, how do you incorporate day of week effects in your pricing strategy? And again, this is something a lot of people do already. And last one is the premium for holidays and events. So depending on what's coming up in future, you might want to bump up your prices or bring them down. And that's one piece of it. And that's one part of it being dynamic. Uh, the other part is even for the same day in future, you don't want to keep the same prices all through. So yes, there is an event four months from now and you have raised prices. Suppose three months pass by and you don't get booked you want to start reducing those prices at this point. And that's the second dynamic nature of it. So the first part we have seen a lot of, a lot of people do pretty effectively. Uh, they have historic data to understand, okay, what kind of trends exist, what's happening season-wise, what events exist. The second part is a little harder to do, but it, because it requires a lot of manual work to, to be going in and changing your prices all the time. Uh, and the third one, um, sorry, the second piece of it is, again, four months from now, maybe right now there's the demand is looking okay, but in a few months, something might get announced, a new conference or something. VRM Intel, I didn't, most people probably didn't know about this one. It's not a big enough event to drive a lot of demand more than usual, but uh, because of such things, you still want to like keep a track of everything, and that itself takes a lot of time. And the last lever, uh, actually I shouldn't say last lever, but the last major lever in some ways is, is the minimum stays. So, uh, during Milan Fashion Week, you don't want people to be booking single night or two night stays. It's, it's usually books out for the entire week or at least five or six days. Um, you also don't probably want, and we, we'll touch upon that, you probably don't want short stays coming in six months out because then you're, they're blocking off your calendar. Uh, you don't want single night stays that, single night Saturday stays where you could have gotten a four night stay. Uh, and then again, you have to track your day of week trends to see, okay, do, do I usually get shorter bookings on weekends? Do I usually get longer bookings over weekends? What can I do around there? So before uh, we go any further, I, you don't have to do this, but we have a tool that's freely available that where you can plug in your reservation data and it tells you, it, it draws some certain charts for you automatically to say, these are the trends that we see uh, that can help guide you in, in terms of uh, what kind of strategies can you set up for your portfolio. So I'm going to look at sort of these five different aspects of, uh, of revenue management. Uh, seasons, day of weeks, events, far out closing, and stay length. Um, and then I'm going to reference some charts from, from this Excel tool that we have uh, as we speak. Uh, so the first one being season. So Season, again, it, this is something most people already understand. Um, there is a high season and there's a low season. And this is a portfolio from uh, one of our customers in, in Europe. And they're, they're in a city that's very weekend heavy, and we'll, we'll see that. Uh, obviously, it's booking a lot more, like most European uh, cities, it's, it's booking a lot more during summer. December has a peak because of the last two weeks of December. Uh, but you, you can already see that they are actively managing their pricing at this point. So they are, they are increasing their prices during, so they seem to have done something funny in May here, which, uh, which we later figured that they shouldn't have done. But uh, in general, you could see that they are managing their prices, trying to figure out, they're doing a lot of experimentation to see, okay, what's going to work with us, work for us long term and what's not. But if this is what your chart ends up looking like, you already know that in January and February, you should be lowering your prices a lot more than normal. And when July comes by, you can really like bump those prices up. And this is what pretty much what ends up happening. And I'm sure a lot of you do this already, where if you look at your April prices versus your July prices, your July prices are going to be much higher than your April prices. Uh, now similar, the next thing that, that I want to, uh, this one is a little more interesting than the previous one because seasons are sort of, done and dusted in some ways. The day of week trends, uh, again, like I said, this was a very weekend heavy city or location, and you can see that in terms of, uh, actually I didn't discuss the, what these charts show at all. So 
the first one says how many bookings started on a certain day. So if I go back, uh, this one is saying, okay, this is the number of pro this is the number of distinct bookings that started in a particular month. Uh, it doesn't talk about how many how long that booking was. That comes in in this chart where it's saying what's the total number of days that were booked. So bookings that were two nights long will be counted more in the chart below versus in the chart above. And the right two charts are about revenue and the average nightly rates. So now with that, with that in mind, if you look at the same charts by day of week, what you'll see is in terms of revenue, clearly the weekends are almost double the weekdays. Uh, in terms of bookings, they are not really double, but one and a half times, but they are becoming double because it's both the prices are high and the number of bookings are higher. So this is, this is, this is a strategy that's working well. So if, if it looked like, hey, we are charging about the same amount, the revenue is doubled because the number of nights booked are doubled, then you know that you could raise your weekend prices. You will reduce a little bit of your occupancy, but that 2x will become 2.2x or 2.3x. Now the important thing to look at here in this chart, the, again, the number of bookings started, is it's saying, yes, Saturdays look like they're more booked than Fridays, but actually most bookings tend to start on a Friday. Um, so in, in, in that sense, is there something that we can do uh, to take care of that? Like, is that something we need to focus on? And what you can do is obviously increase your weekend prices, but also keep the minimum stay of the weekends to be two. Uh, there's, there's no point taking a single night booking on, on a weekend when most of your bookings end up being two nights. And if you do end up getting a single night booking, not a single night booking, maybe a Thursday and Friday get booked and then the start Saturday is a lone night and you know you're a weekend heavy location, go ahead and change the minimum stay for that Saturday to be one because you want something out of that Saturday if, because people who are booking the entire weekend are not able to find you at this point. In, in terms of events, it's again very similar, this is, just the seasonal chart, but it's now broken into like 365 days in some ways. And this is, again, we are looking at a portfolio. We are not looking at market data yet. Uh, but looking at your portfolio itself is going to tell you a lot. So uh, it, it looks like the, so the peaks here, you see that the weekend peaks are sort of the, where every, everything is booked. So in, in summer, in fall, in December, in December it looks like a few more properties list up or show up uh, in the inventory. But it looks like you're, they're running pretty full during the weekends. Uh, and it looks like the prices have been raised over the weekends. But it's sort of also suggesting maybe you could go a little more. If, if you're 100% booked, there is room for in increasing your prices a little more on those dates. Um, again, this is the December last week and January first week tend to book pretty well uh, in most of Europe, uh, and that's what it's pricing out, uh, showing out. Now, in terms of uh, events, most property managers tend to keep a track of the big holidays, the big events that are coming up, and and you know in your location what's up there. But but like Cam has had mentioned, there might be a wedding coming up that that you don't know about that's happening in your backyard, not your backyard, but somewhere around you which is going to drive your prices up, or which is going to drive your demand up. And how do you keep track of that? That's something most pricing tools around today uh, will do for you. So if you, if you don't know that a certain price, uh, event is coming up in your area, the prices will still automatically go up, and then you can go and check, hey, why are the prices for, I know there's a concert coming up here, but what's happening on this Monday and Tuesday? Week, weekdays are usually low demand, but the prices seem to be high. And then you go and check and you find out, okay, there's, there's certain events happening in that area. Uh, and could be a conference that just did not get advertised, uh, not in your network at least. Now, far out versus close in. This is, again, a strategy that works pretty well for most of our customers, where if you chart out how many bookings are coming how far out, so in this portfolio, it looks like there are a certain number of bookings that are coming three months out or more than two months out, but a major chunk of the bookings here seem to be coming between 14 and 60 days out. So you can 
you can call this your sort of primary booking window. You're saying, okay, this is the time, and this, this is very dependent on location. There are markets where most booking, bookings end up coming like 12 months out. People tend to book their vacation for next year. And then there are city markets where most, book, most of the bookings end up coming in the last 60 days. So you need to figure out what's happening in your area, what's happening in your portfolio, and say, okay, just based on that, it looks like I should not try to sell out too cheap in this very far out region. Also, I should probably, once this like primary booking window has passed by and I'm still open with inventory, I should probably look at reducing my prices because if most people are booking between more than two weeks out and I'm still left open, I should start discounting my prices. And that's what seems to be happening here. Uh, the average prices are pretty high three, three months out, and it's great if you get bookings there. Uh, but as you come closer by, you have to start discounting. Uh, one thing you have to keep in mind, though, that you don't want to go too aggressive with this because it's possible that, as much as possible, you want to take your bookings in this region to say, why should I take a booking on a discounted rate when I can get a market rate? So I probably I should not give a premium. The risk there is you might sell out too early for too lesser rate. So there's a fine balance between those two that, that you have to figure out where does that balance lie for my portfolio and, and then implement that. Sorry, I think I talked about all of this uh, already without really looking at the slide. Uh, is this more or less clear in, in the sense? Okay, mm -hmm. cool. So last one is, is stay length. <laughs> Now, again, this one is starting out. How many reservations come in that are one day, one night long, that are two night long, et cetera, and so on and so forth. And it looks like in this location, most of them are less than a week long. Uh, in terms of average prices, the single night stays are fetching much less than pretty much everything else. Uh, and and we'll, we'll see why that's happening. Uh, but and the longer the stay is, the price in general is reducing, and part of it comes in because of length of stay discounts or how, what, because the longer the stay is, the, the shorter stays, the two night stays, are probably just Fridays and Saturdays booking, whereas the four night stays are including a Monday and a Tuesday, which, which drives the average rate down. When it comes to seven day uh, bookings that are seven night long, then your length of stay discounts start kicking in. If, if most people tend to do that because operationally they're just, it's much better to get longer bookings. Um, now, what you can look at it, so now I'm going to look at the same chart. Actually, this is not the same chart, but this is the chart that we had looked at. Forget about the different colors, but now I'm looking at how far out did a reservation come. So was it within the last two days, within the in three to six? And again, this is the primary booking window that we talked about earlier. But now the colors within this chart is showing are showing what was the length of that stay? So it looks like most of the single night stays are coming in the last two days. So this is people booking last minute because they just found out about a meeting. They just found out their friend is going to be in town and they just want to go uh, stay for one night, do whatever ha they have to do at the city and then head back. Um, but you also see that there are these one night stays and two night stays pretty far out. So two night stays are still okay, but if you're taking one night stays like 30 or 60 days out, then you're pretty much blocking your calendar or stopping yourself or your guests from booking longer stays because now you have sort of sold your inventory that uh, your only, only options now are to take other shorter bookings and this is not something you want to do. So one of the strategies people do is they, they say, okay, I don't want to take short bookings far out. I only want the longer bookings. Uh, and then as the day comes closer by, I'll probably want to, if it's last minute, I know most of the one night bookings come in the last two days. Sure, let's only allow one night bookings in the last two days. Uh, and, and that's something that's uh, pretty useful. And again, it depends on preferences. I'm, a lot of people just don't want one night stays. They are, they are operationally challenging, they are, uh, some, and a lot of times not cost effective. Uh, you can raise prices, but then in the last minute, raising prices is also not the best strategy because you 
there is plenty of inventory out there and you want to stand out and raising prices is not going to help you with that. So it's again up to your preferences whether you want to take even two night stays or not. Some people just go with, don't give me anything less than three. And, and that's perfectly okay. If, if they, their calendars are getting filled up with that, it, well and good. Now, when you are looking at all this data and looking at the charts, and for all of you, this chart might look very different, and there's going to be different learnings that come out of that. Uh, you have to go and figure out what's the trend in my data going to look like, and based on that, figure out, okay, first go and check, have, have I been doing pricing correctly or not? So when, when, my when my listings were fully booked, was I increasing my prices at all? Did I do something about it? Um, and then understand your preferences. Preferences. This is what I talked about. A lot of people do the last minute discounting, the short stays, etc. A lot of people don't. And we had some customers who said, okay, I don't really want to do last minute discounting because I don't want to start attracting that kind of bookings. I want to keep last minute. I don't want people who book shorter stays come for parties or whatever. I just want in the last minute, raise my prices. If somebody is willing to pay, sure, but I want most of my bookings to come far out. I want to plan ahead. And again, that's that's completely up to you on your portfolio. And then understand what kind of levers you have in doing all this. So dynamic pricing is one, uh, minimum nights is one, so those are the two major ones. But then there's there's a lot, a lot of other things. There are long stay discounts and uh, extra person fees that can be, so extra person fees can be a real revenue generator for a lot of people. Um, and long stay discounts, again, helps operations because then you're saying you want to encourage longer bookings and you want to set up policies that encourage a behavior from your guests or your potential guests that you want. Now, uh, with Price Labs, a lot of these things are sort of automated, but again, a lot of these things are settings that you can change and uh, with every property manager you want a certain set of behavior or a certain pricing strategy and you can do all of that. But again, we look at hyperlocal data. Uh, so for every one of your listing, you understand what's happening in your area in general, what's happened in the past, what's happening in the future uh, that can be a predictor for events and holidays. And then depending on your preferences, you have all kinds of customization options to say, how do you want to do things? Uh, and the way any of this works is uh, with a PMS integration or a channel manager integration. And I know there were some questions about that, but so Price Labs pushes uh, prices and uh, minimum stay, et cetera, to PMSs and channel managers. And then the PMS takes care of sending it to all the different channels uh, so that most PMSs also allow you to set up uh, channel specific markups. I'm pretty sure everyone here is aware of that, like uses those, where if booking.com is taking a commission of 15% and Airbnb is only taking 6% or 3%, uh, you want your net revenue out of a booking to be the same irrespective of the channel. And uh, So in some ways you're maintaining price parity in the sense you are, uh, you're getting the same amount regardless of where the booking comes from. And then uh, uh, if you host your own, and a lot of PMSs actually allow you to host your own uh, website or uh, your own booking engine where you're pretty much running commission free and uh, those prices show up there as well. Uh, so with that, I wanted to close. I know I just ran through this, but at 12.20 the startup competition starts, so this is good. Uh, any questions? Yeah, are there any Sorry. advantages or disadvantages of doing integrating with channel management? So we, we have customers who directly use us. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you ask this question again with a mic? Yeah. Because this is being recorded. <laughs> yeah, are there any advantages or disadvantages to integrating with either PMS or channel manager? Right, so, with, so we have customers who integrate with uh, Rentals United today, which is a channel manager. Um, and most of these customers, so there are two kinds of scenarios where you would want to do this. One is we don't integrate with your PMS already. So if you use, for example, Guesty, Guesty integrates with Rentals United and then uh, pushes the prices out. But we can directly push prices to Guesty. But suppose you didn't use Guesty, you use some other PMS that wasn't integrated with us. Uh, we can't send your prices there, so we have to sort of send your prices to Rentals United. 
the only issue we have seen coming up is in reporting. So when your PMS generates your owner reports, at this point, the PMS is not getting to know what prices are being sent to the channels because all the communication about prices is happening between Price Labs, Rentals United, and the channels. If the PMS, you have to turn on a switch in Rentals United to say, hey, I don't want prices from the PMS because Price Labs is sending them. So at this point, the PMS doesn't know what's happening price-wise. And so when you generate owner reports or when you generate your revenue reports, those will be off. But won't the PMS know anyway? There's no report being paid for that reason. That is true. That's why it's possible that, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure about this. The reporting thing happened with one customer and they were like not sure what to do with it. But there are pl plenty of other people who have been using the Rentals United connection and it seems to be working fine for them. Is it all right if I ask another question? Uh, what, what external data do you use? So we use uh, hotel data coming from GDS and we use Airbnb data. Uh, we have found uh, that Airbnb pretty much covers most markets around the world. Uh, and because most people tend to use a channel manager, um, their calendars are pretty synced across. So even though a booking might have come through HomeAway or Booking.com or somewhere else, eventually the calendars in Airbnb will show that. So uh, it, it paints a pretty complete picture of what's happening in that area. other questions? What sure. ROI do you get? It, again, it depends on your, where you start from. There are people who start at literally flat pricing. And in that case, it could be like anywhere between 10 to 30%. But for most professional managers who already do something, it's going to be between 5 and 20. Because uh, you, you already know your area well, and you're already pricing it well. The, the piece I think this was way back. I was the piece that we are bringing in is the the second dynamic nature. So you're already changing your prices. We are going to show you events that you didn't know about and help you raise prices there. And we are going to automate this whole uh, discounting or raising prices across your portfolio uh, last minute. That if you did manually, it was it would take too long, and because of that, a lot of people end up not doing it. Hey, sorry. I, uh, first of all, I want to say actually thanks to the Price Labs for their clients. We have 300 flats all over UK with them. I think they're doing a good job. Uh, and we use Rentals United as well. So the way we integrate with, with, with Price Labs is that we connect Price Labs to Airbnb listings directly. And then we connect price ups to Rentals United, and then in Rentals United we we convert those prices, we adjust them for Booking.com and 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 for HomeAway. I'm actually more interested in, in sort of the future uh, things that you guys you guys are planning to do sort of in the next three to six months. All right, so uh, it's it's a hard question to answer to everyone because most people don't know what we do right now to know what's yeah. coming in future. <laughs> Uh, but in general, uh, we want to create more and more tools for property managers to sort of manage their portfolio the way they want in some ways. Um, so there are a lot of options to customize certain strategies within Price Labs, but we want to provide even more. Like almost every week we get some feedback from customers saying, hey, this is great, but it would be amazing if you could do this as well. And we're like, that does sound pretty nice. So we'll try to do that. Uh, and then the other one, the big one that we want to do is uh, with more and more customers coming in with like large portfolios, you want to enable sort of multi-user logins where uh, Miguel will be managing a certain portfolio and then certain other part, part of the portfolio could go to someone else and so on and so forth. And then the last one, the biggest one is reporting. So uh, all this information, all these charts that are pretty good to look at. They're actually not there in, in Price Labs right now. Uh, I mean, this is an Excel tool, uh, but we want to like help you get those insights directly in Price Labs on, in your day-to-day, -day, uh, not day-to-day, -day, but uh, every once a week or once a month uh, when you're trying to sort of recalibrate your strategy as to say, okay, is this working? Is Which part of it is not working? 
uh, you can come here and say, okay, this is this is what we, we should do going forward. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Yes, Mike. <laughs> Sorry about this. Yeah. Um, of those um, four price levies that you mentioned, which were nightly rate, minimum stay, extra person fees, and long stay discount, mm -hmm. which of those does Price Labs set for you? It depends on the PMS you work with. Okay. Uh, in Rentals United, we set prices, minimum stay. I think we also set the weekly and nightly discounts. Uh, sorry, weekly and monthly discount. Uh, I don't, yeah, and then uh, extra person we don't. I think that you can set directly in Rentals United and that, that works too. Because that's not something we think of as needing to change every day in some ways. Uh, yeah. I'd like to add on to that point. What about if you integrate directly to PMS or? It's pretty similar, it depends, so it depends on the PMS itself. Uh, so there are PMSs where you can set the extra person fee or the weekly and monthly discounts at a listing level. And there we we don't necessarily touch it because you can just, just directly go and put those in. But there are PMSs where for every night, every season we create, for example, every night that we create, that weekly discount has to be put in separately. And at that point, it's, it's wrong to ask you to go in 365 times, enter that, and we just do that at that point. So it depends on what the PMS allows. Uh, with different PMSs, we uh, we work differently there. And can you say which PMSs you are most closely integrated with? Uh, yes, most closely is a hard thing to answer. But, sorry, I'm going to just quickly show the list because that might be easier. Right, so it's uh, booking sync. So all of these, uh, Kigo is the one we we only send prices to and nothing else. Uh, so I would say we are not closely integrated with Kigo, uh, but everything else covers everything. And I know a lot of super control is here if you want to talk to them. Guesty is here if you want to talk to them. Uh, and those two integrations are pretty good. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for attending. Uh, if you have any other questions, <coughs> if you have any other questions later on, uh, stop by at the table, and I'll be happy to answer. <laughs>